Welcome to Disney's Four Scores. I'm John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers working today and reveals the emotional journeys, inspirations, and unique challenges of their work. We're delighted to have Gordy Habb with us today. Gordy is one of the most acclaimed and sought-after composers of music for video games, particularly those in the Star Wars franchise, and he has twice won ASCAP's Composer's Choice Award for Video Game Composer of the Year. And he's won multiple Game Audio Network Guild Awards, including, twice, Music of the Year for his Star Wars scores. Welcome, Gordy. Thanks for having me. Let me start by asking where you're from originally and a little bit about your musical background. Yeah, sure. So I was born in Richmond, Virginia, and then shortly after that, my family moved to a small town just outside of Richmond called Mechanicsville. Not a lot of exposure to classical music, but my exposure was, of course, listening to the great scores in the films that I was growing up with. My introduction to orchestral music was through film, and it really sort of spurred my interest in writing music, uh, even at a very early age. So from the age of six, I was already interested in trying to come up with my own music. And so my musical background roots all the way back to seeing films that John Williams or Alan Silvestri scored and just really falling in love with that music. Well, what instrument did you play? I play the trombone. That's the only instrument I'll claim to play on any <laughs> level of proficiency. But I also play, you know, a bit of everything, guitar, drums, piano I use as a tool mostly to write, but I can play a bit of piano as well. Was it always your goal to score movies? You know, I think like every budding musician, the first dream is to become a rock star, so that was my first. <laughs> but uh, shortly, shortly after realizing that my musical interests lied more in the side of orchestral symphonic music, I sort of quickly diverted from that dream and saw writing music for film as an opportunity to really bring orchestral music into the world uh, in a commercial way. So how did you get into game scoring? That's an interesting question. So I had moved to Los Angeles to uh, go to USC for a grad school for a film scoring program. And the, the idea of writing music for video games is something that never actually crossed my mind. I just wanted to do film strictly. But I met a few people while I was at uh, school at USC, uh, one person in particular, Jesse Harlan, uh, and I became very close friends. And his interest was strictly video games. Fast forward maybe a year, And uh, Jesse had become sort of the head of music at LucasArts, which was the Lucasfilm's video game uh, developer uh, division. We were talking a lot, and he said, well, actually, we have this video game called Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings, and uh, we're looking for a composer. And it just so happened that I had just finished writing this, the score for this short film that was called Ryan vs. Dorkman 2. I'm sure that there's going to be some fans out there that know what this is. (laughs) It's, uh, It's two guys in their 20s just dressed in their regular street clothes fighting with lightsabers and it's really quite brilliant the choreography is amazing both of them went on to do special effects at at, at Lucas and when Jesse said that they were looking for somebody to do this Indiana Jones game I said well actually I just finished a thing that's sort of stylistically similar and uh, it turned out that everyone at LucasArts had already seen it and already heard it and were very interested in talking to the guy that wrote the music so that was my first uh, sort of step into the video game world. So you do the Indiana Jones game, and in a way, you're sort of already in the John Williams ballpark, right? Yeah, they definitely wanted something that was stylistically fit well with the established sound of the franchise. When they were working on a Star Wars video game, Star Wars The Old Republic, they felt that I would be a good fit for that as well. So working in that aesthetic actually sort of jump-started my work in the Star Wars universe. Are you yourself a gamer? Yes, I am, Uh, (laughs) but I'm much more of an old school gamer. I mean, I grew up with video games, you know, and at a certain point in my life, my interests shifted to more music, and uh, around that same time, video games shifted to more of a first-person perspective, which, you know, funny to say, I kind of get motion sick from first-person perspective. So (laughs) I had to learn how to play these types of games in a way that wouldn't make me dizzy. 
I really do love games and I got more into playing as an adult as well. How important is music to the gaming experience? I sometimes wonder if it's even more important or at least more prominent than in films. I would actually agree. I mean, my first instinct would be to say that it's as important as music in film because it carries the narrative line. It guides the emotion, what the end user feels, you know, their emotions and their sense of intensity. But for games, how somebody plays can change the outcome of the game, even within one scene. So the music is vital in telling the, the gamer uh, to indicating exactly how well they're doing or, or not. I mean, if you hear music that suddenly becomes much more intense and dark, it's actually an indicator to the player to step up your game. Or it could become suddenly very uplifting and fanfarish and uh, cueing you in that you're doing really well and you're likely going to win. I mean, that's a very simple way to describe it, but it is more of an indicator for emotion, but it also has a second component of telling the player how they should play or how they should react to a given situation. So how many Star Wars games have you done now? Ha! Actually, I have to count. The first one was Star Wars The Old Republic, and then I also did this game from Microsoft, the Star Wars Connect. Fast forward a couple years when LucasArts closed their doors and it became a Disney property, and I jumped back into working in Star Wars games with Battlefront. So I did the Star Wars Battlefront 1 and 2. I've done some mobile games. I even just recently scored uh, a Star Wars version of The Sims and then Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And then, of course, most recently, Star Wars Squadrons. What's the process like when you start one of these? In movies, you tend to meet the director, maybe read a script or see a rough cut, and then you have maybe a month or two to write a score. How different is it in the game world? It's quite different. My background, as, as I mentioned, was more in film, and I had become used to being sort of the last role on any project. The film is done, it's being edited, and then they bring in a composer to write music. With games, it's very different. They actually bring in composers sort of in the middle of the production process. So by the time I'm starting on something, there's still not even finished graphics to look at. So I'll be working from storyboards, from descriptions, from scripts. They both kind of happen in parallel to each other, uh, the development of the game and the development of the score. And so the score will adapt as the development of the game content itself will adapt. Usually it's a, it's a longer process, so to score a film might be somewhere between a month to three months, but it's not uncommon to work on a, a video game score for a year, maybe even more. Wow. Yeah. Who do you work with? Do you work with a game designer or a producer? Who are the people who are calling the shots or who you are collaborating with? It varies from project to project, of course, but uh, typically there's an audio or music director, an, an employee of the actual game developing company. And then... Above the developing company, there's usually a game publisher. More directly, I work with the developer's audio director. But there's always still this oversight of the publishing studio as well. So is there an overall concept for the music in these games? I mean, for example, what would the directive have been on something like Battlefront 1? Actually, it's been different between each of the Star Wars games I've worked on. For example, Battlefront 1. And this was an exact quote from the music director at DICE in, in Sweden who developed the game. We are looking for someone to compose the B-side to the original Star Wars scores from the 70s. So my goal was to actually write music that could seamlessly transition from the scores from the films into my own music in a way that felt completely natural as though it was originally written that way. It was just sort of the lost tracks that you never heard in the film. That was Battlefront 1. Battlefront 2, they just said, gloves off, do what you'd like to do. And uh, so I developed completely unique themes for every character and sort of my own sound a bit more. Fallen Order was even more so, where they really just sort of allowed us to create whatever we wanted as long as it fit the narrative. So it varies. But do you tend to stay within a certain sort of sonic world that is uh, familiar to us as the John Williams sound of the Star Wars movies. Can you talk a little bit about what you're striving for and what we need to hear as Star Wars games fans? First and foremost, I'm a Star Wars uber fan. So <laughs> let's get that out there. Uh, <laughs> so as a fan, I always try to approach these things as what would I want from a different composer as a fan? It needs to feel like it fits into the universe, but I also want to hear something new 
because we've all heard the music from the films and we've all seen the films, but these games are trying to do something new. So why shouldn't the music accompany that as well? So to anchor it in that aesthetic that we're all used to hearing in a Star Wars project, orchestration is key and keeping it 100% symphonic is key. Those are the two main things that I always make sure that I'm doing. Uh, but then additionally, featuring the orchestra as the feature. You know, a lot of modern scores these days feature the orchestra as one layer, but this type of music needs to be strictly symphonic. So starting from that point, I'm usually pretty close already, as long as I'm thinking in that way. But then I have to somehow inject my own musical aesthetic into this. So I write musical content, and then as long as I'm orchestrating it in this sort of more symphonic way, it usually comes across feeling like it fits into the Star Wars universe while also being unique, and that's sort of my goal. Has that always been comfortable for you? Are you comfortable in the orchestral symphonic world? That's where I'm most comfortable, actually. I got very lucky, in a way, <laughs> to land in a position where I got to really do what I feel I do best. So I think for me, it doesn't come naturally because music this, of this type is not easy to write. I don't just sneeze this stuff out. But that said, if I just turn off my brain and do what's most natural to my own musical inner ear, what most often will come out is something that sounds pretty close to what I've been writing for these, these games. So it's usually the other way. If I'm working on a different project, I have to sort of rein that in a bit more. But here I'm, I have this ability to just let go. And, and I think that music feels most natural to me because it really was the very anchor point in my musical development. Uh, it was the music that inspired me to write music in the first place. So it's in my DNA. I, I think I grew up in this perfect sort of time, this age group, where that music that John Williams was writing for Star Wars or Alan Silvestri was writing for Back to the Future, those scores were very impactful in a time in my life where I knew nothing about music. I think if I was 10 years older during that time, I'd also be very inspired by it, but I'd also have musical knowledge by that point. So I'd be analyzing it. Instead of analyzing it, I was internalizing it. And so when I write music, I just, it's what feels most natural to me is what was internalized. That's fascinating. I love that. Have you, have you met John Williams? You know, only once. And I can't really claim it as a, a meeting of John Williams, but uh, the year I moved to Los Angeles to go to USC, I had just moved in, got a new apartment, went to Costco to buy, you know, the bulk toilet paper and whatever else. And John Williams and Yo-Yo Ma just happened to be in Costco signing CDs in the CD section. What? <laughs> yeah. So in I Costco? In Costco, of all places. <laughs> they had just released a joint CD together. At first, I was taken aback. I, I thought, is, is that really John Williams? But then you see Yo-Yo Ma next to him. It's like, okay, this is really happening. <laughs> so I dropped my, you know, 50-pack of toilet paper, went into the CD section, scanned through the film section, found the only John Williams CD I could find in there and bought a copy of Jaws, ran over there and got him to sign it. That's the oh, only so, time I've met So him. you did get a signature? I did, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. that's so great. <laughs> Disney's Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including Gordy Habs scores for the Star Wars Squadrons and Star Wars Fallen Order video games. The Four Scores playlist is available on all major music streaming services. Experience the magic behind the music you love whenever you like. I've spent the last three or four days listening to as much of your Star Wars music as possible. <laughs> and not only is it extraordinary in that it is very much in the Williams realm, but it's also compelling on its own. And, and I wonder, these seem like very large scale projects. How big have your orchestras been? Yeah, for each of these projects, even starting way back with uh, The Old Republic, which is my first Star Wars video game, we had a hundred piece orchestra and a full choir. For the Battlefront series, because my direction was to write the B-side to John Williams' A-side of the album, I said, well, if that's going to happen, we need to make sure that every level of the production is just like the A-side. So let's hire the London Symphony. Let's go to Abbey Road and record. And we had a 105-piece orchestra at Abbey Road, the London Symphony. 
and uh, the London Voices, Eighty Piece Choir. And we really went all out. So the budgets on these things are somewhat astronomical compared to many films. The sky's the limit. How exciting is that to be recording with the London Symphony Orchestra in Abbey Road? It is awe-inspiring, to I'll say bet. the least. <laughs> the first time I ever recorded there, I can actually recall this is kind of a short story, but I think you'll appreciate it. You know, lots of work building up to the recording session, preparing all the music, and, you know, my first trip to London, my first time recording somewhere other than L.A., so I was nervous about the music getting there. So we're running around with 12 suitcases full of sheet music, and we get it on the studio, librarians pass everything out, and we're sitting in the booth. And I thought they were just maybe sound checking the speakers in the booth for us to hear using some music from one of the films. And I look up, and they're rehearsing. And it's the most brilliantly, perfectly executed version of everything that I had imagined in my head. It was an emotional moment for me. I mean, I basically lost it. I couldn't believe this was happening. And I thought, wow, that's the first time I've heard the London Symphony play my music. It's absolutely awe-inspiring and emotional. And I hope I never lose that. And to be honest with you, I never have. Every single time I go back, it's just as exciting and awe-inspiring. Oh, that is so great. And we were talking in general about how different game music can be than film music, and particularly in terms of quantity. How much music, on average, is in these games? How much do you have to write? So it's typically more than, I'd say, your average film would have by quite a bit, actually. So The Old Republic, the first Star Wars game, uh, we had somewhere in the ballpark of 10 hours of music written and composed and recorded for that one. The Battlefront series between Battlefront 1 and 2, I think, combined is, is in the 10 to 12 hours worth of music. Jedi Fallen Order had seven and a half hours of music in it. It's really quite impressive the amount of music that go into these projects versus a film where maybe the average film might have 45 to 60 minutes. If it's something like an epic, like a Star Wars, then it's going to be wall to wall. So maybe you have an hour and a half to two hours. So, I mean, these games, they just have vast amounts of music because you have to account for every possible scenario that a player could encounter. Even within one scene, there could be multiple possibilities. So you have to account for all of them. Yeah, Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. I find that a fascinating aspect of what your job is now. Since the games are so interactive and players can choose different paths and maybe face different enemies and use different weapons, how do you handle that musically? Do you have to write different options for a certain sequence. Talk a little bit about what's necessary. So, yes, is the answer. I have to write for every possible scenario, even within... Uh, I'll use an example. So, say there's a two-minute battle scene. Your average player would take two minutes to get from point A to point B, and then suddenly the battle increases and, you, and the music gets more intense. Some players might take 10 minutes to get there. Some players might get there in 30 seconds. So, I have to account for every one of those possibilities as I'm writing. So yes, I write a two minute long getting ready for battle cue, but then I also have to write a slightly more intense version of that exact same piece of music and then a slightly even more intense version of the same piece of music. So you have three levels of possibility for intensity and then write also transitional elements that can take you from one intensity level to the next or back down. So you have all of these what we call stingers in, in the game world that can transition you to and from all of the possibilities. It's actually interesting. It reminds me of when I was a kid, I used to read these choose your own adventure books where you read, you get to the end of chapter one. It's like, do you want to walk down this tunnel or do you want to turn around and go you know, through the woods? If you want to go through the woods, turn to page 23. It's like the musical equivalent of that. So I have to imagine every possible path and write a piece of music for that path, which is a pretty interesting technical challenge. Yeah, let's back up a little bit, though, because mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. How do you start? Um, do you start by writing maybe uh, long-lined themes or, uh, or moods and conform later to the specifics? How do you start? For me, I always like to start from writing themes because I think the most important thing in a score, whether it's film, TV, game, whatever it may be, is a theme. Those are the things you walk away from remembering. Those, it's almost a character in the project itself. If you get a good theme going, then you can carry a lot of material with that theme. 
if, if you're working sort of blindly with no source material, that's the daunting side of composing. But if you have this, like even just a grain of an element, just you know, four note motif is enough for me to write 20 minutes of music. There's an example of it in Fallen Order where there's a four note motif that was for Gorgara, this, this giant bat <laughs> that you have to fight in the game. And it's just four notes, but this, this scene could last 20 minutes. And I crafted the entire scene based on those four notes. But you know, that would have been a very daunting task to accomplish without any source material. But just having that little grain to work from, that's key. And what are you looking at when you begin to write? Is there any kind of early animation or an animatic? Or I think you did mention storyboards. Yeah, oftentimes it's storyboards uh, because they're still working on the graphics and the uh, animation while I'm working on the music. As I'm writing, sometimes I'll get in more information and I'll, I'll start to see the game coming together. In the case of Jedi Fallen Order, Respawn Entertainment is actually in Los Angeles. So I was able to go into the studio once a week do playthroughs of the game, see how it's working, see how it's shaping up. And it was actually very helpful in guiding my musical approach. But that's not as common because, for example, the Battlefront series, you know, was all produced and developed in Sweden. So I'm not going to fly to Stockholm once a week, uh, even though that might be fun. <laughs> but uh, from there, I'm just working from still images, many, many conversations, you know, weekly or, or twice a week meetings with the director to discuss aesthetic and, and musical choices, and uh, just working from scripts most often. If it's a story-based game, I'll, I'll have a script, and I'll know all the characters, and then I'll get to see it shape up as my music shapes up. Many contemporary composers are highly technically gifted and work in computers, but I understand you still use pencil and paper. <laughs> is that right? That is absolutely correct. It's, Why it's, is that? You know, it's one of those things that I kind of wish wasn't the case because <laughs> I think my life might be a little easier. But it's just the way it's the way my mind most naturally creates music. It's the shortest distance from my brain to the real world, even to the point where oftentimes I don't even use a piano. I just desk and a piece of paper and I just write what I hear in my head. Because for me, I need to get rid of as many obstacles in the way from brain to real world with the music. And of course, it's interesting to know that John Williams is one of the other remaining composers in this town who still uses pencil yep, and paper. Yep, exactly right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things you mentioned a little bit earlier was the, the role of orchestration in what you do. How would you characterize the, the sort of Williams pattern? Is it traditional classical orchestration, maybe rooted in late 19th century symphonic work? How would you characterize it? I think you just nailed it, actually. It is exactly that. I mean, he is a, a very avid student of classical repertoire, and particularly from the Romanticism and late Romanticism. It's very evident in his music that that's what inspires him, in the same way that it's that probably evident in my music that he inspired me. In fact, at a certain point, I decided that it would be more beneficial to study those very things that inspired those scores versus to study the scores themselves. You know, Tchaikovsky scores and Stravinsky scores and studying, you know, the Firebird Suite and seeing, oh, wow, I see all of these little elements that I recognize from scores that I've heard that I love, where you're really using the full range and the full capability of the orchestra. Have any of these scores required you to create new sounds or maybe even new instruments? That's something I always actually like to do on any project I work on. I want to sort of put like a personal stamp on the score by creating an instrument or just more noise type sounds, uh, found sounds. That's some, something I do on literally every project I've ever worked on. Jedi Fallen Order, we did a couple things. One, we featured an instrument that I had personally never used before, which I thought was a lot of fun to work with, which is the contrabass flute. It's taller than me, <laughs> and it loops back around. It looks like a giant number four, and it has some of the coolest sounds. So we, we worked with that instrument and tried to add something very unique. I wanted to do this, this sort of, the idea was a slide whistle but a contrabass version of a slide whistle. We all know the pew whip kind of thing that you hear like a slipping on a banana peel, but I'm just imagining this really dark, low 
slide whistle. So I worked with the percussionists in London and they helped me invent and design and build this bass slide whistle made out of large PVC pipe. And we actually used that in the score for Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. That is so cool. That's exciting. Yeah, it's very fun stuff. Let's talk a little bit about Star Wars Squadrons, which is the newest game from EA. What was the directive here? For this one in particular, the, the feel of the game is very much a throwback retro, you know, kids playing with their Star Wars toys, creating their own little space battles. That kind of vibe is what it was really after. We wanted the score to also feel like it was part of that retro sound, even down to the point where our recording aesthetic choices to have the score be slightly more dry than maybe like a London Symphony at Abbey Road. We used the musicians in Nashville, still a hundred piece orchestra, but in a slightly smaller room and even took those considerations in when we were mixing and, and mastering, but we wanted it to feel like it fit in with the more retro sound of the, those first scores from the original trilogy. And uh, tell us if the pandemic required you to alter any of your planned recording concepts and procedures. Yeah, it did. It was unfortunate, but necessity is the mother of invention. So we found a way. I'd say maybe 65, 70% of the score had already been recorded, and then we were hit with the pandemic. So I actually recorded each musician one at a time in a small studio in Nashville, literally flute one for a whole day, just playing flute one parts and so on and so on. It was like 45 days of recording individual players and then collating all of that later, putting it together and mixing it in a way that would sound symphonic and match the rest of the score. So it was a very unique challenge, but I think we managed to, to pull it off quite well. That sounds like, a, I don't want to say a mixing nightmare, but a huge mixing <laughs> challenge. Yeah, indeed it was. Uh, so my mixer on this project, Steve Kaplan, did a brilliant job of this. I mean, particularly after having just mixed somewhere in the ballpark of two hours of music for the game that was all completely symphonic. Now here's the last 45 minutes or something like that. You have to do it this way and make it fit with the rest of the score and feel seamless. So that's a huge challenge and, uh, you know, kudos and hats off to Steve Kaplan for that. Uh, but despite the challenge, what you're saying is it worked. Not only did it work, I think it added to the aesthetic in wow. a way. Talk, and talk about it, that. Yeah. So like I'd mentioned before, we were looking for this slightly more retro approach to the sound of the orchestra. And modern orchestra recording techniques in particular have gone for this more grandeur, this size. You want to hear how gigantic the room is. But the original scores were not recorded that way. They were very dry in a way. I mean, everything was very close and intimate. So it actually played to our advantage because it gave us this very close, intimate sounding recording that put together sounded symphonic, but still had this element of uh, this sort of close mic and, you know, very present sound. You know, with all of the music that you have to write for these games, do you need collaborators or orchestrational help or, or a team to help realize it all? Yeah, definitely. It's a vast amount of music with a lot of oversight. 50% of the job is writing music. The other 50% of the job is quite literally administrative. So. I have a team of, of guys that I've been working with. Sam Smythe was the first person I started working with years ago on the Indiana Jones game. And he's been doing mock-ups for me ever since. So because I write by hand, I'll send him the sketches that I write and he'll produce fully realized orchestral mock-ups of it. Orchestration, I tend to handle myself because that's what I feel is my strongest uh, asset. But I do have a pretty solid uh, team of about five guys that work with me. What would you say the biggest challenges have been for you throughout this entire period of doing Star Wars games? Keeping it fresh. That's the hardest thing because, you know, I am working within some parameters that have been set and an expectation from the fans. And I hold myself to the same standard that I hope that the, the Star Wars fans would hold me to. That's probably, for me, the toughest challenge of all of this. Keep it fresh, keep it interesting, always add my own personal aesthetic into this as well, make it unique but also make it feel like it fits into all of our favorite franchise in a way that both honors the original material but creates something new. What's your favorite part of the process? Recording it 100%. The writing part, 
I also enjoy, don't get me wrong. But the writing part is it's a lot of alone time. You know, I'm in my studio writing 16 hours a day on average when I'm on a project. The payoff is getting to hear it come to life because all these things that you've been imagining, and, and when I'm writing, I'm thinking about the musicians I'm writing for as well, you know, but nothing beats the real thing. So the payoff for me is getting to, to actually hear it come to life with the orchestra. There's nothing better than that. Would you like to score a Star Wars movie? I would love to score a Star Wars movie. That's the answer. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yes, please. Gordy, thanks so much for taking time to talk with us today. John, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends. It would also be great if you can rate it, because that really helps others find the series. Check out the video games for Star Wars Squadrons and Star Wars Fallen Order, and listen to the soundtracks wherever music is enjoyed.